Hey folks, Matthew Weiss here, WeissAdvice.com and Weiss Advice here on YouTube. I got a question in my Instagram that's a little lengthy, but it brings up a lot of uh, good questions that I think a lot of people have and also illustrates some misconceptions about some pretty complicated stuff. So the subject of today's video is going to be sample rates and bit depth. And I'm going to just kind of go through this question here. It's a lot, but uh, it, it will be something that we can break down pretty easily. So the question is, can you make a video on how we should print our files? Should we render 32-bit or 24-bit? If CPU is an issue and we want to do more processing, is that a consideration? Also, should we export 32 or 24 for mastering specifically? Also, how should we record vocals, 48K or 44.1 or something else when we have a project on 44.1? Also, should we start music production on 48K uh, or the music production on 44.1? <laughs> Okay, so a lot of, lot of stuff in there, but let me uh, first explain what sample rate and bit depth really are. So sample rate is the rate in which data is recorded into your computer, basically. So it's, you know, the difference between analog and digital is whether or not the signal is continuous or discrete. Basically, the way digital audio works is it takes discrete data points and then uses that to map what a continuous function should be. So your converters take a continuous analog signal and chop it up into different data points. And then the converters on the way back out take those same data points and use a reconstruction filter to create a continuous point. Now, one of the misconceptions here is that there are stair steps or uh, um, kind of like photo snapshots of audio inside your computer. That's not really true. It's data points. Data points can be used to create continuous functions. It's not the same as like film where you're seeing 24 frames a second and they're literally 24 different pictures of something that's specific to film and your eye gets tricked into believing it's continuous. The data actually represents a continuous function. So that is sample rate. Bit depth is your points of measurable amplitude where energy scales. Is it the quietest, quietest signal, or is it one point above that? And we have millions and millions and millions of data points scaling all the way up to what we call full scale, and that's your zero decibel ceiling. So your data points are on a plot. They're points in time, amplitude points in time, and that creates our waveforms. So I know it's a little heady and a little bit weird, but now let's get into the more practical stuff, which is what does it mean and where do these numbers come from? So bit depth is fairly simple. The greater the bit depth, the more amplitude points we have that we can scale. And once we get to what's called a floating bit depth, then we can actually scale proportionately so we can keep turning things up above zero dB full scale and still maintain the relative scale of our amplitude. So basically it means that we remove the digital ceiling. That's what a floating point does. Now, it's the, there is a ceiling in there eventually. You can hit it, but you would have to turn up signal way, way, way beyond, way, 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 way beyond. Basically, it becomes a moot point. Uh, sample rate is a little bit more complicated. Sample rate is based on human hearing, that we can approximately hear anything from as low as 20 hertz to as high as about 20 kilohertz. Now, 20 kilohertz is a little bit generous, frankly. Most people do not hear particularly well over about 17,000 cycles. Uh, I know my hearing starts to drop off at around 17k, and by about 18.2, I can barely hear anything, and that's still considered pretty good, especially for somebody who's my age, younger people tend to be a little bit more prone to be able to hear higher frequencies, but it's fairly unimportant. By 20K, generally speaking, most human beings cannot hear anything. So 44.1 gives us a little bit of a buffer. The idea here is, the, the reason why 44.1 comes about is because there is this theory called the Shannon-Nyquist theorem that says that as long as you have more than two data points, that's all you need to calculate what a waveform would be. So any sine wave that is being produced at 22 kilohertz could be accurately produced if we have 44,100, the 100 is to make sure that we have more than just two, uh, 44,100 samples per second. Then we can grab 22,000 hertz. That's the basic concept. And this is true. This has been proven to be accurate and correct. Now, 
the film people have said, you know what, we still want to have a little bit more buffer in there because we're going to be, you know, working on more high fidelity stuff or I don't exactly know what, but basically somewhere along the lines, the film people got together and said, uh, we want to put in a little bit more of a buffer in the human hearing realm. So let's make it 48 kilohertz so that everything up to 24,000 cycles or anything that is technically under 24,000 cycles can in fact be reproduced. Now, I don't think that there's a single human being on the planet that can hear anywhere near 24,000 cycles, but hey, we can reproduce it. Then people started looking at things like uh, the aliasing distortion that comes from when little bits of signal end up going beyond whatever limiters are put into place to keep uh, signals above, say, 24K from being captured, uh, that when it gets when it gets through the uh, low-pass filter that's built into most converters, it starts to confuse the data. The data starts to look like something else because the data can only show up in so many places. It can't accurately produce 25,000 cycles if it's only taking data points at every 48,000 uh, samples per second. And so because the data looks like something else, it causes waveforms to show up that weren't originally there. And that's where the word aliasing comes from. It comes from the idea that this frequency that is existing in reality has now put on a disguise as some other kind of wave shape and has now aliased into something else. And so some people have said, you know, let's go up higher. Let's go way above. Let's go to 88,000 or 96,000 samples per second so that we're capturing things so fast that we never have to worry about any measurable amount of aliasing distortion again. Of course, there's certain problems with that because as you start taking those samples faster and faster and faster, you need something called a clock to make sure that the relationship between when the actual data point is occurring and when it's being recorded are the same time. And as things get faster, those clocks need to work a lot harder and become a lot more technically restrictive. And that is called jitter, when the clock is not keeping up correctly with the actual time that the samples should be occurring. And so as you go up in sample rate, you are more prone to jitter. Now, modern converters really don't suffer from that at 882 uh, or 96. It's not until you start getting up into like twice as much as that, like 192,000 samples a second, that's when jitter still becomes an issue. And personally, I think that the trade-off in any converter I've used, you actually end up getting something further away from the signal when you start going above 96. But up to 96, things are still pretty darn good. And so, you know, it works. So what does all of it really mean, though? Like, what is what does that mean to us? Well, let's go back through these questions here and kind of uh, work all that stuff out. So let's start with the bit depth here, which is, uh, should we print our files in 32-bit or 24-bit? And it does CPU become an issue in that regard? So the first thing is that in terms of CPU, sample rate is going to be a lot more prohibitive of CPU than uh, bit depth. So there's really not too many cases where working at 32 float is going to mess up your computer these days. Uh, but that said, you know, I believe that the best working way of going about things is to set up your session to function at 24 bit, meaning your levels, the way things are coming in should be in that nominal realm of, you know, I guess some people say minus 18 dB full scale, but I mean, it's so hard to put a number on it when you have, you know, huge transient spikes that can go way over. I usually kind of say like just tapping the yellow. <laughs> <laughs> on the full scale meter is usually a pretty good starting point, uh, but it's not that important. What's important is that you're giving yourself enough room to turn things up before you would hit a 24 bit digital ceiling. That's the mechanism that I like to observe. So my workflow revolves around setting up what we would call, I guess, our digital gain staging in reference to a 24 bit system, even if I'm working on a 32 bit floating system. Now, yeah, you don't have to do that, but it will help alleviate problems down the line. So, for example, if you do run into a situation where your CPU is getting glitchy because of your bit depth and you need to go to 24 bit, you're still going to be set up. Your workflow is going to be fine going from 32 to 24 because you already set it up that way. If you accidentally print from a 32 bit floating session into a 24 bit file, you don't have to worry about accidentally clipping. And if you happen to be doing something like broadcasting your session, which I do 
do sometimes. I don't have to worry about a 32-bit floating bit depth running into a conversion of 24-bit and not clipping on my end, but clipping on somebody else's end. I think, and also if you're integrating with analog systems, setting up for that 24-bit working system is going to integrate with an analog system a little bit cleaner and more easily. So there's a lot of reasons just to basically follow the workflow of 24-bit, even if you are working at 32. Now, if you're doing it that way, then whether or not you print uh, 32 or 24 doesn't really make a difference at that point because you're not going to get any accidental clipping. So you're fine. You're in the good. Uh, that said, if I'm going to be printing one or the other, I would probably just keep it at whatever my working rate is. So if I'm working 32 float, I would print a 32 float file and that's to send off to mastering or to the client regardless. Uh, I, you, you might as well just keep it the same. Now, for the final print, the final master, you are going to have to have a fixed ceiling. So you are going to have to eventually get your scale down to work with 24-bit because an MP3 is not a floating bit depth. It is a solidified bit depth. So 24 is going to be best for MP3. And if you happen to be going to CD, CD is fixed at 16-bit. So you would have to dither down to a 16-bit print. So it depends on the medium that you're going for, but generally speaking, speaking, you will not be creating a final print ever to a floating bit depth. It's just not going to happen. So, okay, the recording side of things. Uh, should we record our vocals 48 or 44.1 or something else when we have a project on 44.1? I, generally speaking, like to keep things the same as whatever the project session is, just for the simplicity of workflow, and so I don't have to do any sample conversion. There technically is some artifact from sample rate conversion, although it's pretty darn subtle. So, you know, like nothing that I would ever write home about, for sure. It's not going to affect your final results in any meaningful way, but just just for the ease of work, I would say if you're working in a 48 session, just record 48. If you're working in a 44-1 session, just record 44-1. Uh, the only place where sample rate really makes much of an audible difference is when you start talking about things that would require faster data points in in order to compute accurately. So that's going to come into anything where time stretching is going to be part of the equation. So if you're doing elastic audio where you're stretching or condensing words and syllables in your edits, or you're doing pitch correction, which requires some degree of time stretching or some mechanism that involves time, those are going to work generally a little bit better at higher sample rates. And the artifacts, if you're used to the older systems, are a little bit noticeable. Still nothing to write home about really, but they are certainly noticeable if you really know what to listen for. However, these days, Days, most of our pitch correction software has oversampling, so I, I kind of feel like going up to higher sample rates is sort of a moot point as well. Uh, people will say that 88.2 or 96 sound better to their ears, and I, I, I will say this. While I don't personally notice any real difference, it's hard to make direct comparisons, but while I haven't really noticed any significant differences between 44, 48, 88 to 96. If you find yourself hearing a difference, I would say just go for what your ears are telling you. There's really nothing wrong with it. No matter what you end up doing, you're still going to be able to get good results. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to make a completely great sounding, commercially viable record at 44.1. And I think anybody who feels otherwise probably is focusing on the wrong stuff. But basically, to answer that question, I would say just keep it at wherever the session is at. Uh, if you really want to, you could double your sample rate. If you were at like 44.1, double it up to 88.2. Upsampling is very clean. So, you know, double it up to 88.2, and then you can record your vocals at 88.2 if that makes you happy. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. As long as your computer can actually handle the workflow of it, your CPU is going to hold up, and you have the data storage for it, then it's fine. It's probably preferable because you are technically capturing more data a little bit cleaner, so certainly not a bad choice. Uh, but don't feel like if you're doing it at 44.1 that somehow you're bottlenecking your sound. You really aren't. Uh, when we have a project at 44.1, also, should we start music production on 48K or 44.1? Uh, I would say that depends on what you're producing the music for. So here's where sample rates do become relevant. They are relevant to your formatting. So for example, CD renderings, not that anybody really prints CDs these days, but CD renderings are always going to be 16-bit 44.1. So if, you're, if you know you're going to end up on CD, then it's not really a bad idea to be working at 44.1. For film, where you have to turn over things like stems for your sync or whatever it might be, 
that I would say you're going to want to at least print to 48K and you might as well start by working 48K because the music editor is going to be expecting 48K. That said, if you send 44.1, you're just going to like slightly irritate a music editor for like a split second. It's really not that big of a deal to just like pop it up to 48K, but you know, it, I guess it shows a little bit more understanding of, of the world of film if you were working at 48, but I don't think that there's a sonic benefit really to either one. I think it's more just a formatting benefit. Uh, so a lot of jargony information in here and everything like that, but I, I kind of want to cap it off with a second thought, which I think is a little bit more important. Generally speaking, when people over fixate on the merits of different sample rates and bit depths, they usually don't produce very good results because they're fixating on something that they feel is going to automatically give them a better sound as opposed to earning a better sound. Things that earn a better sound is getting better at mic selection, getting better at mic placement, getting better at level balances and mixes, getting a better ear for tone and time and emotion, things like that. This, These are the places you really need to be focusing on if you want to get the better results. The things like sample rate and bit depth, while relevant and something that you should have a technical understanding of, are really very secondary to the overall feel. There have been plenty of amazing sounding records done 16-bit. I mean, really, you could be working even at 12-bit and probably get away with it, although you probably start to hear some funky stuff happen a little bit. Um, you know, especially if there's like a massive dynamic range in your record, like it's like it's an orchestral recording, orchestral recording. There we go. Um, but ultimately, like, I don't want to like pass the buck and say it doesn't matter. It just isn't as important as fundamental musical ideas, recording techniques, engineering techniques, arrangement songwriting, that kind of stuff. And if you're not getting the results you want, chances are it's not because of the sample rate or the bit depth. It's probably because of something happening within either your workflow or just your actual skills. And that's a harder thing to get down. It requires more work. It requires taking more responsibility than simply saying, oh, I was working at the wrong sample rate. But in reality, nobody is going to care about what you've created in your mind to be the solution, people are only going to hear the end result. And it's a lot more important just to get the skills going. So, okay, that sums up my thoughts here. Uh, I hope that you have uh, learned something from this, have a good takeaway from it. Uh, yeah, let's wrap up here. If you dig this video, hit that like button. If you want to catch more videos like this, hit subscribe with the bell notification so you get notified. If you want to learn how to develop those skills, hop on over to weissadvice.com where you can get access to all of my pre-recorded tutorials as well as join in our weekly webinars for some uh, good hands-on learning, get access to the trackouts for the various records that I've been permitted to use, and also get your hands on some of my templates and presets. So yeah, hop on over to weissadvice.com. Lastly, you know what we say here at Weiss Advice, we are musicians, sound is our instrument, and I will catch you next time.